This meeting is being recorded. Cool. Little announcement and everything. All right. Well, uh, starting again. Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Gabe or Gabriel. Um, I am the president of the St. Paul's Greens uh, Green Party of Ontario on the Green Party of Ontario side. Um, thank you all very much to the, again, the mayoral candidates for taking time out of your schedules to come here tonight. Um, thanks very much to all of the attendees for caring about uh, local democracy uh, and for coming on uh, a bit short notice to this panel. Very excited to have everyone here. Very excited that the St. Paul's Greens um, were able to put something like this together. Uh, we're really proud of the capacity we've built. Maybe I'll say, um, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll do the land acknowledgement and then I'll speak a little bit about um, the St. Paul's Greens and what we actually are as a group so that nobody is confused. Um, but first, uh, I'd just like to acknowledge that Toronto is on indigenous land. This is the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy or the Six Nations Confederacy, the Wendat, uh, the Missis and the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. Uh, the Toronto St. Paul's Greens gratefully acknowledge these Indigenous nations for their guardianship of this land. Um, and we'd also like to remind and reaffirm as uh, Torontonians and Canadians our accountability to these Indigenous nations and to all Indigenous peoples and communities living in Toronto. This land is part of the Dish with One Spoon uh, territory, a treaty between the Haudenosaunee Confederacy the Anishinaabek uh, and allied nations to peaceably share and care for this land, its waters, and all of the biodiversity in the Great Lakes region. Um, all those who come to live and work here are responsible for honoring this treaty in the spirit of peace, friendship, and respect. Um, I'll say a little bit about the Toronto St. Paul's Greens, who we are. Um, so we are actually two organizations, both the local branches of a Green Party, the Green Party of Ontario and the Green Party of Canada. Um, but we do all most most of our or almost all of our work together. Um, so I am the president of the provincial side and Tim um, on the federal side. We also have Adam Deutsch, who is our, uh, I guess his official title is like, Superman at large, and um, does a bit of everything for us. Uh, he's going to be helping facilitate tonight. The St. Paul's Greens are not um, officially involved in municipal politics. We are not endorsing any candidate, um, either for mayor or for um, our ward, Toronto St. Paul's. So we just want to make that very clear right off the jump. But we are a group of concerned citizens who have um, a set of concerns, a set of interests, things that motivate us to um, pay attention and care about politics, including municipal politics. Um, uh, and you know, those are some of the issues that have always concerned the green movement, things like climate um, and justice and uh, inequality, among other things. Uh, Tim, maybe I'll uh, I'll pass it off to you. Yeah, uh, thank you. I, I won't say too much more on, on the Greens because you said it well. Um, I think those of you who have encountered us know that we take pride in working across cross-partisan. I don't know if non-partisan is the right word. I think it's a cross-partisanship. We'll, um, we'll work with people who are working for good solutions and um, you know for the environment, for social justice, uh, and so on. Uh, a brief note on the setup of this. This is community organization. I know we had talked about the library um, if any of you does wind up in, in municipal politics, our libraries, their facilities are often not ventilated well, not large and comfortable, and Adam did scout the room we had booked and we just didn't feel comfortable, and we probably would have gotten fewer people to the meeting, so it's um, uh, not ideal not to be in person, but um, that was a choice we made, and, uh, and also for the, uh, the change of, of webinar link uh, in the last few days. Um, we're, uh, we're all stretched with other municipal volunteering as well as work in school, as I'm sure you are too. Uh, but I think it's, it's great to do grassroots things like this. And I'm looking forward to the next you know, 90 minutes or two hours. Um, Gabe, do you want me to go over the timing rules now or did you have more? 
Maybe I'll uh, I'll speak a bit to the agenda for tonight, uh, sure. just to remind everyone, um, anyone who received um, our email blast announcing this event, and also, of course, the panelists are received uh, something about the agenda for tonight, but I will repeat it and maybe even copy it and put it in the chat. Uh, the structure of the event for tonight is that uh, following these opening remarks from the St. Paul's Greens, we're going to give each candidate uh, two minutes to introduce themselves and make a brief statement. Then we're going to open the floor up to questions um, where each candidate is going to be able to have one minute to respond. Uh, we're gonna aim to try and have as many questions as possible uh, and hopefully get the audience to yeah, submit many questions but uh, most importantly is yeah, keeping the time in check. Uh, maybe Tim, you can explain how you're gonna do that. <laughs> uh, yeah, I just have a uh, stopwatch open on my other screen. Um, I will go in alphabetical order to start uh, a subsequent question. The next person in order will go. So uh, Darren Atkinson will do the first two minute intro. Chloe Marie Brown um, next in line would answer the first question and so on down the list. At the 50 second mark, I have the yellow card, The Gay Science by Frederick Nietzsche, important work of philosophy. Um, and the red card at 60 seconds is the back of John Lacar, Tinker Taylor, Soldier Spy. Um, so I thought that was a fun way to do it. And we don't want to mute, but you know, if it goes over the one minute or the two minute, um, we will because it's a, a large panel and we need to, um, to move. So do we want to start with the statements then, Gabe? Yes, let's start with the statements. Um, so I think for just the statements, Tim, for an order, we were thinking of doing it just to start with the order you appear on screen, but then we can we can randomize it after that. I think um, it's easier for me if we do alphabetical. Okay. All right. Yeah. Well, let's let's, I, let's I start have everyone here in a file. So all right. I'll start with Darren Atkinson. I'll just make sure I have everybody in my little file here. Uh, I do. So Darren, you'll go first um, for two minutes starting now. Oh, you're on mute. Darren, you're on mute. There we go. All right. My name is Darren Atkinson. I'm running for mayor of Toronto. I was spurred on by the fact that uh, my father and some of my family have been through healthcare and they received very poor service from the government. Uh, but that doesn't particularly pertain 100% of the point um, to Toronto, except for the fact that I was tired of watching politicians not actually follow through on their promises. And ultimately, I see myself as an independent who would want to run to be mayor of Toronto to actually oppose any party for that matter that doesn't want to help the people within the boundaries of Toronto, regardless of what party it is, even the Greens. I'm sorry, guys. If you're not going to return our taxes, you're going to solve problems that are particular to the jurisdiction we're talking about, then why should we cooperate? We're going hat in hand. And with a billion dollar shortfall, I find that a lot of services might not have meaning if they can't be funded. And that's where they've got us. Until we correct that to some degree or think of a different way to deal with it, we're going to always be pandering to the province and the feds. And it really won't be much we can do soon because we'll be so far past the eight ball with interest rates going up, we'll never be able to control our budget or control what we do. And you need money to do things. So while we spend billion dollars on subways and whatnot, whether you wanna park or you'd like to keep your services through Parks and Rec running, it won't be possible. And it'll be quietly just brushed aside and you will live in a city like that because at some point you have to control your finances. I'm not a conservative with regards to finances. I just mean that one and one should be two and where's the money going? Those questions should be answered. So I would run interference against anybody who would oppose anything that we were doing that was on our agenda and they tried to sell us a bad bill of goods, particularly from an accounting point of view. And uh, you know, from a respect point of view, we give out a lot of taxes, we don't get it back. Where is it? Thank you. Um, Chloe Marie thank you, Darren. Brown. Yeah, thank you. Well, let me reset my timer. Um, please. 
Hi, good afternoon. Good evening, everyone. My name is Chloe Brown, and I am running for mayor because after eight years of subsidizing corporate Canada, it's time to rebalance the scales towards the working class. And what that would mean is looking at the policy services and programs that have been favoring corporate Canada over the last eight years and that have had us bleeding our pockets to subsidize large scale projects for corporate legacies versus the livability of our residents. So my plan is looking at tax stabilization through the land value tax that would uh, apply fair taxation to not only residents, but charities, uh, church spaces and land owners as opposed to property owners because not all people that are paying taxes on property own the land. So that's one act of stabilization. The second thing is to rezone our land so that they actually work for residents. Uh, since World War II, the luxury standard has been the single family home. And as time has changed, our needs have changed as well. And it's time that that is reflected in policy. Um, <clears throat> The last, sorry, <clears throat> the last thing that I would put forward is rebalancing the public service so that it employs small and medium sized businesses. So breaking up large projects so that they can be actually achieved by small and medium sized businesses and resident groups that are focused on creating local development at a community grade scale. This is all possible if we take control out of corporate Canada's hands and return it back into the hands of residents and communities that have the capacity and talent to solve these problems, if only elected officials got out of the way and trusted those who elected them. So my final pitch is that we need to restore democracy because although we live in a capitalist society, democracy is missing from our basic forms of local government and that's needed to get us back on track and to restore the economy so that it works for people and not just businesses. Thank you. A little bit over, uh, but great. Thank you. I'm going to reset. And uh, Sarah Queen Hega. Thank you very much. Um, you know, some people might know that I ran for the Green Party about three years ago in St. Paul. So just letting everyone know that. And I then uh, basically have abandoned party politics altogether because I think, like you mentioned, Darren, there's a lot of problems. Um, with partisanship. And I, so I love the Green Party because they allow free votes. So that's why I kind of had chosen that one. But anyways, just putting that up there and I've now left party politics, but I really appreciate what the Green Party is doing right now to hold this debate. And I would love it to see the other parties doing the same things. We need people to be holding these debates and having writing associations who are particularly interested in politics and whose audiences are particularly interested in politics, having them hold debates is a great way of reaching out to the community and being connected between elections. So I just wanna thank you and your members very much for having this debate and for attending it. And I echo Chloe's comments about local democracy. That's definitely a big part of my platform. Did I say Sarah Kleiman Hank? I'll, I'll say it again if I didn't, but it's a part of my platform is that yes, we absolutely need residents involved in local decisions far more than we have right now. And it starts right now with this election and we are seeing um, what's happening with the status quo reinforcing the status quo. And it's getting so strong that it's almost uh, it's almost not moving. People don't even know there's an election on. They certainly don't know who else is running. The media is presenting a very, very limited slice of candidates. So our democracy starts right here. And here we are all participating in it. So I think that's wonderful. In general, you know, my approach is about, it's about local democracy. It's about listening to different ideas from everyone, no matter where they are on the political spectrum. And it's about some values that are core to me, which are integrating the environment into our economy. They can't be separate. Um, better transit, more housing, fewer rules, but the rules that we have are high standard and enforced clearly. Uh, so that's just a bit of a sample. Thank you very much, everyone, for having me here. Great. Thank you. Uh, and we're keeping the time. So, so far, so good. Uh, Philip Cruz. Hello. You're on mute there. Starting you now. Philip, you are on mute. I'll give you a few extra seconds okay. there. Okay, thanks. Hi, my name is Philip Cruz. I'm running for mayor. 
my platform is all about people, human decency, uh, basic things about the people are missing. You know, rent reduction is my thing, food security, landlords. Uh, the city's lost trust in the in, in the council. Basically, you know, I get a lot of questions like, "What's the use? What's he supporting?" You know, that's where you got to put the trust in the people. You know, as Chloe says, democracy. You know, we don't have that anymore. You know, it's a, a dictatorship now with the new rule with the Beatle coming in. It's going to make it a lot, a lot harder. But I'm all about like my whole platform. You read, it's all about the people. Simple things, things that happen. You see, we don't have seniors, uh, housing, you know, transportation, you know, economy. You know, I don't belong any party. The only party I go is on Saturday night having a good drink. That's my party. So that's it for me. Done. Thank you, Philip. Uh, good. Reset my timer. <clears throat> And Robert Hatton. Am I on? Um, You're ready. Tell you a bit about myself. Uh, I live in Ward 14. I, I raised two kids, lived in Toronto most of my adult life. Um, I worked for the city in the finance department for 25 years. I dealt with most of the major issues that are uh, key to the election now, like housing, funding, waste management, transit funding. I negotiated a billion and a half uh, five-year transit deal with the province. Um, climate change, I pushed and was the key guy on deep lake water cooling for the city, issued the first green bond, developed the city's new taxes on uh, under the city of Toronto Act, land transfer tax, vehicle tax, that sort of thing. The reason I'm interested in running for mayor now is because of the, mostly because of the strong mayor powers issue and the, the, the impact that's having on democracy in this city. The, the current mayor approves of or supported the, the strong mayor powers. And I think what they do is result in a strong mayor in a weak city because the premier can now tell the mayor what he wants and the mayor doesn't have to ask council to make it happen. So that is my biggest concern. Um, but I'm also very concerned about um, the housing and the way it's funded and the way that the city is using developer tax breaks to try and uh, achieve housing objectives. And they are unaccountable, ineffective. No one is tracking the impact of those things. And it's hundreds of millions of dollars a year. And I want to plow that money back into services. And lastly, I think there's a complete absence of leadership on transit. Uh, Metrolinx has taken over. Uh, we need representation on the board. On climate, nobody knows what the city wants from us on climate. And on Ontario Place, you know, the province has big plans, and I don't think most people would support what they're doing, and we need representation at the city on Ontario Place. Thanks. Thank you. Um, and apologies if I mispronounced Soad Hossein. Uh, yeah, so you said it correctly. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Saad Hossein. I'm 26 years old. I'm the youngest person running for mayor, and I'm a progressive as well, too. So just a little bit about me. I was born and raised in Toronto, um, in Scarborough, particularly on the East End. And uh, pro um, professionally speaking, I am a project manager. I work full-time as a project manager at a tech company, working on large-scale projects and complex ones as well, too, with uh, the main focus of those being to optimize and improve things in the company so that way it can operate better um, and save money. So when it comes to my platform, it, it ties actually directly to that. So my platform breaks into four parts. The first part is on optimization. So improving exactly how money is being used by the, by the city, how resources are being distributed and how other sorts of uh, components of the city is being used in managing how the city runs, whether it's like the waste management component of it, the programs and services for children, youth, adults, and the elderly, and all those other different areas. Um, and then all the other parts of that. So it's like um, improving how all of those are being used and then using and through improving and optimizing those, then taking the funding from those and then putting them in other areas where they should be. Like for example, recently we've heard about like the libraries getting their fundings cut. That's like for an example where, um, you know, through optimizing some of the things inside the city in terms of processes and activities, then, you know, we can take the money for that's being saved there and then put it to, uh, into the libraries. So that's the first part. Second part's on transit. So improving, uh, TDC pub, uh, public transit, um, and then uh, working with Go, um, Go and Metrolinx and all these other parties in improving uh, public transportation within the city, but then also focusing on um, introducing new modes of transportation. So whether it's like in, um, incorporating like e-scooters or tax um, or water taxis or other things of that sort, it's introducing new modes of transportation as a means. 
And the last two parts is on um, housing. So introducing new types of housing, uh, putting tax, uh, tax policies around housing. Um, so it's easier for people to buy homes. And then last but not least is programs and services. Program, programs and services. So making uh, programs and services more accessible to people, increasing the funding and resources for them and making sure that they're more accessible to the public and um, funded and uh, provided properly. Thank you. Um, okay, and don't think I've missed anybody down to Naya Singh uh, with the last alphabetical name on our list. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Nia Singh, and I'm your candidate for mayor. I was born and raised in Toronto. I'm 48 years old, and I am not new to the political system in this province. I first ran in 1997 when I was 23 years old, and that is because I saw a huge gap between the everyday person and those who controlled government. And that gap has been widening, and after the past two and a half years, we see it has expanded incrementally, exponentially. Um, I'm extremely concerned with accountability at City Hall, especially with the councillors who are responsible for their regions. And we have a myriad of problems that have been taking place, such as violence for me is the top issue. Um, we have not addressed the fact that violence uh, has been increasing in the sense that it is unpredictable, the places it's happening, and it's actually preventable. But we have not implemented any type of root cause analysis or um, attention to these issues, which would help make Toronto safer, which in turn would raise Toronto's property values. The next thing on my list is affordability, but affordability has directly to do with responsible spending and how our city engages its residents. Right now, the city seems to be focused on its own profits rather than quality of living. And as mayor, I would push for a better standard and quality of living for Torontonians so we can improve all areas of our outcome. Um, there's mental health issues that are, have gone rampant in the city, especially with addictions. Um, we have to ensure that our residents are well taken care of so they can do the best for our city. Um, I'm, I was a single father. I raised two children on my own. I ran a recording studio for 20 years, so I'm very well connected with the arts community. I'm the first Canadian born chair of Caravana, and by trade, I'm a criminal defense lawyer and human rights lawyer. I hope to do everything I can in my power and use my skills to make Toronto a better place. Thank you. Um, you came in right on two minutes. That was the, uh, the exact number there. Um, good. So, Gabe, uh, do we want to invite questions now? Yeah, I think that is a great idea. Um, so, for everyone who is watching, uh, all of the attendees, uh, the Q&A function is open and you can uh, submit any questions um, that all the panelists will see. Actually, I should ask to the, to the rest of the panelists, have you seen um, any of the Q&A, the Q&A question that has come in already or does that just go to the host? It just, it just goes to the host, yeah. It goes to the host? Okay, thank you. Yeah, sorry. You have received but, questions already, Gabe. Yeah, so I I I um I received a, a question, so I okay. guess I will be interpreting all of the questions. Who knows what spin I'll put on them? Yeah, I mean, um, I do. I could start. I did bring one of my own. Uh, we didn't want to. Yeah, we do have. Much. I could start with one, problems. and people watching that'll take seven or eight minutes to go through everybody. They'll these will be one minute answers, yep. um, and then hopefully you'll get a few more in the meantime. You want to do that? Yeah, let's let's start with your question, Tim. Okay, and um, uh, Chloe Brown will go first. So we'll, again, we're just ascending down through the list and Darren Atkinson, you will go last in this case. Um, I actually wanted to ask um, a question about democracy. Uh, the strong mayor system was raised. Um, my question is, is to the perils of incumbency um, and as candidates, as candidates um, how you feel about uh, the lack of competitiveness at the ward level, um, and both in Toronto and in the abstract um, in political systems in general, um, and what you would do, an obvious one is term limits, you might speak to that, but anything else you would do to, to increase that competitiveness um, to make sure that, especially in, in elections that might not have a large turnout um, or maybe smaller at the municipal level, um, that people are, are getting a full slate in front of them 
and, um, and, and able to make choices as opposed to the incumbent just having an insurmountable advantage. Um, so that's my question. I think it's an important one for our democracy. And uh, I'll start with you, Chloe Brown. Let me get my stopwatch ready. And Chloe, if you want to take that away. Okay. So on a personal level, I got my start in politics through a fellowship program. And I think that it's really integral that we do a little more investment in civic education in terms of how we engage young people in coming into civic spaces. So getting behind a counselor's office, getting to sit in chambers is different than just hearing about it. So creating a fellowship program for young people, but also like adults, because there are tons of adults over the age of 30 that should be running, but like because we're older, people just think, hey, you're on your own, go figure it out. And this is one of the things that has been difficult for um, young candidates, particularly running in the other wards. While there is a will, there needs to be a playbook. So one thing that I would invest in is creating a playbook for new candidates in terms of where to go to get your content made. How do you find and source people for your printing? These are like very like politically focused activities that could be making policy, pol political campaigning easier. And that's where I'm hoping to make open source Wikipedia manuals for this. Thank you. Thank you. Good. Reset. And uh, Sarah Kimenhega, where you go. So ranked voting is a big, big thing that we can do to make the races fairer. And ranked voting, the pro province has outlawed that. Um, but I want to sit down with the province again and say, let's hear your arguments for why we can't have ranked voting. And then let's look at it with a legal team and let's see if we can challenge that with come together with municipalities around the province. There's no reason that I can see why the province should prevent ranked voting from happening. So that's something I'd really work hard on. Um, getting people involved in decisions in between elections is very important because that's how people are going to know whether their incumbent is doing a good job or not. And if they can assess that, it's a lot easier to vote out an incumbent or to vote to have them stay if they've done a great job. It shouldn't be just about name recognition. And then um, finally, term limits. I think term limits are unnecessary in a healthy democracy. Right now, the only reason there's this push for it is because our incumbents stay way too long, but they should be voted out. So while I support term limits, the idea that I legislatively enshrined, no, let's have a better democracy. Thank you. Um, Philip de Cruz. Okay, uh, I'm the opposite. I believe in term limits. It should be it should have been done a long time ago. Uh, communication is the biggest thing. There's two high schools where I live. I've asked. I talked about 150 students, and I asked them why you're not involved in politics. They said we don't care. We don't matter. We don't have a voice. Communication. Also with the elder, the seniors, same thing. They not heard. We have to make not only just committees, but our organizations, as Chloe said, you know, people involved. They're getting get people involved to be interested. They've lost interest in the city council. Like city council, first of all, I short the meetings right away. Everyday meetings are well, like what, nine o'clock to like eight o'clock at night. It's too long, shorten it, you know? 4.30, go home to your family, come back and do the next day. You don't have to show people that you're working for your money for the fall, you can just go home. The communication, get people involved, let them be interested, put the trust back in the people to us. Okay. And um, Robert Hutton, over to you. Sure. I, I'd agree that incumbency is a bit, a bit of a problem. Um, I don't support term limits, though. I think that uh, people do develop uh, skills and experience over time, and it'd be a shame to, to wipe that away every eight years or four years or whatever. I think in the mayor's con uh, contest, um, they made it really easy to, to participate, 25 signatures. Um, and so we have a, a, a ton of people competing, and I think that just favors the incumbent. I think they should have had 2,000 signatures as the threshold, and then probably I would have been screened out, but certainly, uh, you know, it would be a narrower field. And then lastly, I think the media is influenced by the incumbent in this case. And I think that puts the challenge on us to get creative, um, use social media and other means to get media attention. And unfortunately, that's the way it is, but I, I'm up to the challenge. 
that one came in right on one minute as well. Um, so Ad Hussein, over to you. Right, so there's a bunch of different components um, to address here. So the first part is definitely education. So getting people more educated about like what politics is and how it impacts their lives. That's like something that I would make, uh, I would do that would be heavily both on like uh, using media. So using like, you know, the newspaper and whatnot, and then also using social media as well too. So Instagram, TikTok, um, all those platforms basically to educate people on the importance of politics and getting involved in politics. The second part of it has to do with um, basically improving marketing within like the organization, the organization, in this case, the city of Toronto, like the way they're advertising the elections right now, it's done is I would say the worst job I've seen compared to all the other municipalities inside Ontario. Like when I went to Oshawa, there was big signs. I was saying, oh, get go out there, get involved, vote and stuff like that. You come to Toronto, like there's not even a single sign that says like, go oh, vote or it is an election coming up in October. Like what the hell? Like we're it's only now that we're seeing it in like the last few months, closer to like the end of September and beginning of October, that they're putting up signs. But that's a really shitty job from their part from city, um, which is something I would address and change that altogether so that people are way are informed much in advance. So that way they know there's an election coming up, they can start doing their research and prepare themselves to properly vote when the time comes. So I'm sorry, so I had to cut you off after uh, after two minutes. Or one minute rather. Um Darren Atkinson, the last answer uh, on incumbency. Sorry, Tim. I, I think um, I'm supposed to go next, I, I believe. Oh, okay. sorry. I apologize. You That's okay. Right. That's okay. So, uh, it, yeah. And do you mind repeating the question just because I think it's uh, gone on a little tangent? Yeah, I'll be somewhat paraphrasing myself, but the question was the perils of incumbency, um, especially in low turnout and smaller elections, things like ward elections municipally. Um, the incumbent has an enormous advantage. Um, I had mentioned term limits, not a yes or a no, but just that's often the most obvious one that people bring up, or what other tactics we can do to uh, to tackle that. Okay, and was strong mayor powers in there? Because I thought that's what it, it initially was. Um, as a preface, I had said that strong mayor powers had been mentioned, and that I also had a, a question about um, basically political structure. But, okay. but no, it wasn't a question on the strong mayor powers. The, the basic question is, what are your opinions on incumbency and what would you do to address it? Okay. Thank you very much. Um, incumbency is unfortunately a huge problem. It should be a great thing because any councillor that is doing a good job should be reelected. But what we have is we have a system whereby the city is not presenting all of its candidates fairly and evenly. And what that does, it limits the pool. And I would say it's actually purposely done by city council in order to keep their jobs. If we look back to how power structures were developed, it was always excluding the poor, excluding the non-landowners, excluding people, and let the wealthy and the elite um, have their, their day. And that's what's continuously happening here. The incumbents have set up a system whereby they know their name recognition is always at the forefront. They will not approve a system that presents each candidate fairly so the citizens can evaluate all their candidates and, and make a decision. And it's specifically designed that way. So my issue is we're just going to have to keep fighting until the public understands that they have been denied choice. Thank you. Perfect. Um, okay, and now it's over to Darren Atkinson for our last answer. Can let me unmute here? Yeah. Okay. I support term limits. Um, being there indefinitely, there's only going to be one Hazel McCallion, right? I mean, that's probably the ultimate politician for me in this province <laughs> in Mississauga. She stayed there her whole life, but you're just not going to have people that are going to sustain that way in their life. We all have peaks and troughs. So I support some form of term limits, first of all. And second of all, those of you who look at my website, damayor.ca, you'll see if you look at me in LinkedIn that I'm an inventor. I've got a patent in 30 countries. You got to think outside the box. The fact we're not voting online now, it's ridiculous. There's more than enough encryption power, more than enough software developers, more than enough um, will to do so. You know, people, when they're done work, barely have enough time to vote. That's the most simple, simplest problem against voting. The practical stuff has to be looked at. I mean, if you extended voting hours to midnight, it might work. Lots of people on shift work. Some of them work three hours. You know, since we've had seven day work weeks where people can be called in for three hours, how can somebody even make it to the polls? Think about that online voting. Online voting would be the biggest change. There's no reason we're not already doing it. Toronto should take the lead on that. We're supposed to be a tech hub. 
Sorry, Darren. I had to Darren. I had to cut you off. Also, after after one minute. Um, uh, Tim, was that the yeah, we're Sorry, keeping a good good brisk pace here. So um, uh, yeah. I think it's great and a lot of interesting ideas. That was a yeah. that was a good round. Um, did we get some questions that uh, you might want to throw up, Gabe? We did. Um, we actually got four questions, all about housing. Um, and so, in the interest of keeping our pace where it is now, um, I'm going to maybe ask, a, I'm gonna sort of split them and, and, and ask them as two questions. Um, the first one uh, is about density, um, affordability, uh, and developers. So uh, Deborah Perry asks, do you have any specific remedies in mind for affordable multi multiple dwelling housing including how to ease up on so many condos being built on land that could be better purposed for units people can actually afford. Um, and an anonymous person uh, has asked, uh, I live on a street where there are seven applications for 34 plus story, sorry, for thir 34 plus um, story high rises. How would you make sure that developers respect communities and the environment while still increasing housing availability? So feel free to speak to what either of those people have said. I'll also remind people that they can ask questions anonymously, um, and that uh, if you don't, I will I will probably read your name. Sorry, uh, Chloe. I see you have a question. No, I was just going to answer the question. Oh, oh okay. Wait, uh, Sarah is first this time. Okay. Uh, so we're going to go through the order again. You will have the last answer in this case. I'm going to change, if I may, Gabe, to the, go ahead. given the importance of this question, this is the number yep. one issue in the city, maybe 90 seconds for this one, because there's a lot to unpack sure. with what you just went through. So there were two we'll questions do, in there. So There were two questions in there. Um, and uh, in the interest of answering both, we'll give people 90 seconds. And Sarah, uh, it is uh, your turn to start. So I'm gonna answer this question a little bit differently than I've answered in the past, because how a mayor needs to do every, needs to have a hand in everything, transportation, housing, crime, environmental protection. And a mayor can't be an expert on any of these issues. And so I find it interesting when people ask you, what are you gonna do about housing? It's like, well, um, I think we need to ask housing experts that question, right? So to me, the question is, who are you going to listen to? Which, as a mayoral candidate, who are you gonna to listen to and how are you gonna move forward? So I think right now who is being listened to is the big money developers. That's mostly being listened to. And then maybe a few very active residents who don't want any development, but there is a huge spectrum of people in between that. And so I want to listen to, uh, yes, I wanted to listen to developers. They're the ones with the money and who are able to build housing. I want to listen to co-op uh, people. I want to listen to nonprofits. I want to listen to the residents. So what I want to do is listen to the people who build housing on the zoning rules that are getting in the way and remove those zoning rules. And I want to listen to the residents who live in the neighborhood and the businesses on what kind of housing we need that will enhance our neighborhoods. And with those two things, with we get rid of the zoning that stops building housing, but we identify what's really important when it comes to housing. And then we have very clear and high standards to protect what we want, but no ridiculous paperwork and rules that make it impossible to build good housing. That's my approach. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Um, Philip de Cruz, you're number two. Well, you're on mute, uh, Philip. Okay. Low level buildings. I would leave it. I'm not a condo man. There's, right now, there's like 52 low level, five, four level buildings here. It's a great neighborhood. There's parks everywhere, there's rec recreation centers. That works. We don't have that anymore. We have too many condos. In this neighborhood right over here, they want to put three condos, 34 stories high. They got canceled because of the zoning. We got to rezone. Also, consider when you rezone, taxes change. Like right now over here, taxes are low. But if you start rezoning that area, the taxes will go up. So we got to consider the people. You know, Quick housing is single apartments right now. They're empty the buildings. Let the government take over, put people in there, get them off the streets. It's not permanent, but it's temporary. Get them off the streets. Empty houses, 
Uh, Isabel's not here. She mentioned there's like 1.5 million houses around. Check it around, they're empty. Let's buy some of those houses, you know, put people in there. It's quick, it's off the streets, you know, it's all permanent. But affordable housing takes a while to build, especially condos. I'm not a condo fan, I don't believe in it. Okay, uh, sounds good. Very set. And so had Hussein, uh, you're up 90 seconds. Um, yeah, so when it, yeah, it, um, it does go into like rezoning and, and dealing with zoning and other policies to address um, housing and then improve it. But there's other parts of it as well too, which is looking into different types of houses and creating different types of houses. So uh, multiplexes is an example of them. Um, six story homes is another concept. So something that they have in the US and looking into these different types of homes that can be realized that are affordable and then realize them in Toronto as one side of it. The second part of it is putting um, tax rules to be able to help first time home buyers and others be able to purchase homes. So that way um, be able to afford the homes that are on the market and then be able to um, you know, buy homes. And the, the next part also has to do with addressing home flippers and spec, uh, speculators. So for those ones there is putting taxes on those people so they can't put in, like, in, uh, insane amount of, of costs on those houses, which make it difficult for people to buy. As soon as we can regulate those people on the market right now, the better we'll be able to handle and allow people to be able to make purchases for homes and then get to where we want. And then the other thing as well too, is just going back to the old school stuff of building apartments that you know we used to build back in the day that people could afford. And you know whether it's like social housing units um, or you know, it's like just regular apartments, just creating those again. Um, so that way, even uh, people starting off, they'll be able to start somewhere, starting with those apartments. Thank you. I have one job here and I've already messed up twice, Robert. I skipped you there, sorry about that. Uh, so you will go next. Um, and yeah, uh, over to you with 90 seconds. Sure. So <clears throat> housing is complicated. The city's responsible financially and management for affordable and social housing. It's responsible for zoning, but it's not responsible for the price of housing in this city and everywhere else in the country. So let me expand on that. On affordable housing, the mayor and the current administration has been giving uh, tax rebates to developers to, to build 4,000 affordable rental units a year. There's no evidence that it's having any impact on the rents of those people. And I would cancel those subsidies and then I would reinvest that money in services and, and housing services. On zoning, the city had a plan to restrict intensification to the avenues, they call it, the main arterial roads. And that seems to have allowed for a ton of excess approvals of development. So there's lots of approved development out there. The other thing the city did is it banned short-term rentals in anything other than your principal residence. And so you can't buy condo units and rent them out like a hotel. It's illegal in Toronto. And I was part of that process to make that happen. Um, and that has a beneficial effect on rent prices and, and housing prices. But what people don't know is almost all the zoning is now under the control of the province because of the uh, transit-oriented communities legislation. Anywhere where there's transit expansion, which is where all the new development is happening, is now under provincial control. And that has to change. We don't have control over that anymore. Thank you. Robert, I had to, I had to cut you off at a minute and a half. I think uh, Robert got to finish his last thought there. Yeah, um, done. Thank you. Yeah. All right. And Nia Singh, over to you. You are on mute. Thank you. As I proposed back in 2018 when I ran for mayor, there should be a rent to own program for home buyers in the city. Um, it's very unfortunate that our city is so focused on profits over quality of life, like I said in my opening. And it's nothing wrong with achieving a high profit. But the profit margins are expanded way beyond the levels of sustainability as we see right now. The mayor of Toronto has to pressure the provincial government to get back to the rent control where we were at in the 80s and early 90s. Because ever since that changed, rents have gone through the roof. Everybody wants to live in Toronto. And to fix this density issue, um, I would be proposing, and if I was mayor, I would be ensuring that every building made, what, no matter what the price of the condo is, has at least a 25% um, affordable housing units made. 
Um, to have a specific amount of units, as mentioned uh, by Mr. Patton, it's not good enough. 4,000 units is not good enough when you're building hundreds of thousands of units a year or even more. So it has to be uh, mined to making sure people's quality of life increases and improves and they can afford. So rent to own, a percentage of units affordable housing, and then also use areas of the city that have to be rezoned. And again, we will have to go to the province to ensure that's done. So the mayor has to hit up the province and ensure they impress upon those ideas. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, Darren Atkinson, over to you. Yes, um, well, the extra inertia on the market's really coming from outside money. And um, without recognizing that, for example, our Bank of Canada always pegs their dollar 30% lower than the US dollar. When people move money around the world, I was working at a company and I ran out of England called High Watt, we had an American dollar account. That's 30%. So when money comes from a, a place like Turkey where the housing market's collapsing, it comes here because we have six banks who are safe during the last crash. So the money comes here for a reason, it protects itself. So getting access to our market is really what we should be um, thinking about here. So basically the province charges what? 15, it went up to 20, it's a slap in the wrist. Take the extra 10%, 10% on top, Toronto has its own money, 20% on foreign money coming in, period, no matter what development. Why should Canadians suffer? Because that inertia comes from outside our country. Two, we at the permit level, if you're gonna take away affordable housing, you have to offer the same amount of units. How you do that, you're gonna to have to work that out. Otherwise you're not getting your permit. Kick every permit back to the OMB. The whole province would be flipping because they'd be backlogged. Play hardball. They're not doing anything for us. It's a fact. The third thing is I developed a new idea, emergency affordable housing plan. Look at what we've got. There's probably 1.2 million homes that qualify for an apartment. Instead of opposing people making apartments and basement apartments, help them get planning, fire permit and inspection together. Then allow people to come to you for consultation for free, not some service that charges them 2000, get their apartment up and running and use what we got. It's an emergency right now with interest rates going up and financial matters. It'll be a disaster by spring. It's too late to do all these other things. Do that, use what we've got. 1.2 million homes, get apartments made, help people create apartments where there already are buildings. We don't need be Sorry, Darren, I had, to, I had to cut you off there as well. Um, Good, so uh, Chloe Brown, you didn't get the first word, but you are gonna get the, the last word on this one. So uh, over to you. Okay, so with this affordable housing crisis, one of the biggest issues is that for $400, a homeowner can go to the Ontario Land Tribunal and stop an affordable housing project for $400. This is one of the issues that doesn't get, get addressed when we're talking about what's creating this crisis. And to answer the question of like, how do you stop these 35 story developments? You have to stop your neighbors from stopping the 16 level development. This is, this is a two prong approach because at the end of the day, people are fighting supportive housing. They're fighting affordable housing because they don't want this type of person in their neighborhood. That is a problem. So this is why the strong mayor powers were created because we are backed up because residents are applying arguments that are not architecturally sound or engineering arguments to affordable housing and blocking it. So directing the city solicitor to find challenges that are against the human rights code of a providing a for a adequate shelter is important to addressing the crisis because we need emergency housing, supportive housing, accessible housing for people with disabilities and seniors. Additionally, rezoning the space and applying a land tax to it will change the way that we incentivize development on existing properties and new properties. A land value tax will create a baseline based on the amenities that surround the land versus the property. That changes the incentive, the incentive for homeowners to create a secondary suite. And then additionally, we are allowed to apply a vacancy tax on top of the land tax to incentivize larger. Sorry, Chloe, I, I also uh, had to cut you off there at, at a minute and a half. Um, so that, that was our that was our uh, last response on that question. We're coming up right on um, 6.40. Uh, and I'd like to propose that we actually take a five minute break um, and return at 6.45 so we can all uh, stretch, get water. I understand that doing these things on Zoom um, can take a lot out of you. 
Um, and this is also something that we would probably want to do if we were if we were doing this in person. Um, so for all of the attendees and for all of the panelists, um, we will see you at um, 645. Uh, the stopwatch is running, so it'll be a, a strict five minutes. We don't want to take too long, but uh, I, I need a little break from all my hand raising. So yes. see you back in five. And I, I will pause the recording. What can we actually can we pause? You don't have to repeat the whole thing just because the recording just started. Yep. 20. This meeting is being recorded. So um, for the next question, John Weston asks, uh, what can the city do to support those who don't have uh, a roof over their heads and who may be suffering for more reasons than one. Uh, it touches on a lot of related issues, but feel free to answer the part that you feel you can speak to the best. Okay, perfect. And uh, Philip, over to you. Okay, uh, I, just, I just took a head count downtown. We have about 15 empty apartments been sitting there for about five years. Also, we have these uh, foreign investors that come and buy these places and they just leave it there empty, right? We should put a charge on that. Affordable housing, we have empty hotels. Neglect, we have TCHM that should have been uh, taken care of back in 2013, neglected. All these things could have been avoided if they were repaired properly and kept on top, like lazy landlords, for one thing. That's my that's my third thing about lazy landlords. Tell you horse through what they've gone, what they've gone through. But you know, the city neglected, you gotta fix inside the city, the people. You know, building outside is good, but the people come first. What you see on the streets, kicking people out of shelters, like the rule should be in a bar, I show you cannot kick anybody out unless they have somewhere else to go. Cannot have to fend for themselves. A lot of people have a lot of mental problems. They need government support. We lack government, not only putting them in places and leaving there, but also support programs, nursing programs, uh, backup, you know, helping them out. Thank you. Um. Robert Hatton, over to you. Sure. Homelessness is a, a really difficult problem. Uh, and I think Philip's right. It's it's not just about creating spaces. It's providing services as well. And, and that takes money. And uh, I think we've seen the team reluctant to put money into services. Um, the other thing that is important to note is that Toronto as an urban center winds up getting a disproportionate burden of, of people who need this kind of help. And so the province has a role in it too. It shouldn't all fall on the taxpayers of the city. But I think ultimately uh, the only way to address this and to do it in a more reasonable cost is, is to get out of the shelter business and into the supportive housing business. And uh, that's where I would put my priorities. Um, so I'll do saying, uh, you're up. Um, so this breaks into kind of two parts. So the first part is like, um, increasing the um, number of shelters and the number of permanent beds in shelters. So that way there's like uh, opportunity for homeless people to stay somewhere. And the second part is basically putting a program in place. So that way these people that are homeless right now are able to integrate themselves back into society and then get their life back to, back together, long story short. So in having this program in place for them, um, they'll be able to, you know, get a job, be able to make some money, and then be able to kind of afford their own place. And then combined with the affordable housing plan that I had before, they'll be able to someday afford an apartment and then be able to work themselves up from there. Great, thank you. And resetting, Nia Singh, uh, you're up on housing. Oh, sorry, thank you. Can you just... Yes, can you just repeat the question just so I make sure I answer it? Um, I, I can paraphrase it. Um, well, or Gabe, I don't want to paraphrase it. Do you want to just briefly? Yeah, I'd be happy to. Um, the question was just about what can the city do to address homelessness, given that it the people who are unhoused might be have, suffering from several problems. Absolutely. Thank you for that. Um, the, the answer to that is simply human resources. I have firsthand experience with this. Um, a good friend of mine who developed schizophrenia in his late 20s ended up becoming homeless after a dispute. And he traveled around from shelter to shelter. And um, 
I would meet with him. I would provide him some support through food and fresh clothing. But what I realized is he would get robbed when he's at these homeless shelters. And a lot of people don't want to be in shelters because they feel unsafe. So it was only through my persistence of calling um, Native Men's uh, Res Association, ensuring that he had the support he needed by, by letting him stay even at my place when there were no shelters available, was he able to get out of it. Now he's in a mental health home, he's being supported, but it was only because somebody has been there and is still there daily to take care of him. So there are many volunteers in the city of Toronto who can help. We have to provide human resource support to these people. very much and uh darren atkinson 60 seconds over to you yes i think me is right you have to understand the nature of homelessness i mean from addiction to um just people who want their freedom they're there for different reasons so you really can't apply one rule to everybody i think uh getting advocacy for them would mean you'd have to physically go and interface with the people and ultimately at the end of the day um, I haven't had as much experience with that, except that when I was young, I was on the verge of homelessness. So, you know, the, the reason why you're there, I didn't want to be there. So you might have offered me a job and I'd take it. But other people who have addictions or have freedom issues, they might not want that. So the thing that I would add that I could only comment on is that when the winter comes, we're a winter country. We have to use the spaces we've got and open them up and pull people together to go in there and chaperone, not chaperone, that's probably an insulting word, but um, commit to being with people during their homelessness, during the cold nights, because there's no excuse for that in this country. We've got lots of buildings the city has that are empty, some of them for tax reasons. They should be opened up and the mayor himself should get actively involved in getting volunteers to go in there to make sure those people don't freeze. And this winter, it could be the worst ever. It's gonna be a hard winter. Uh, there's a third El Nina that's gonna create uh, cold weather this year. And uh, well, just look at the data and the stats from weather to uh, economics. Really, this winter is going to be a danger zone. Sorry, Darren, I had to cut you off there. Um, Chloe Brown, uh, it's your turn on homelessness. All right. So one of the things that I would look at is bringing down the cost of housing for the healthcare providers that have to be in supportive housing to serve this population. Uh, one of the things that could counter what the premier is doing to healthcare workers is bringing down the cost of living. So when you're building supportive housing, making sure that it's mixed use as well. So let's say you want to have a vertical garden that brings down the cost of food. It also creates a food system within an apartment building. So that is supportive housing as well, making sure that there is also like mixed services in terms of healthcare, um, alternative therapy for like whether it's arts care, their recreational therapy, and then ensuring that these things are in place. So the ground leasing system for supportive housing is 20, 25 years, just like social housing is, to make sure that there is stable networks available to people who need supportive housing, whether it's uh, people with disabilities or people that are aging. So making sure that the healthcare workers can live where their patients are and they're co-located to this service infrastructure is really important to making sure supportive care is sustainable. Thank you. Um, and Sarah, you have the last word on this one. Oh, sorry, Sarah, you're still muted. Yeah, you're still muted. I felt. So many good ideas here. I want to re uh, like emphasize what Robert said about the solution is not shelters. It's you know they should be the most emergency situation and supportive housing. Absolutely, I agree with what Nia was saying about human resources. Homelessness is a complex issue and it's different for so many people out there. So it's kind of a case by case situation. Some people will need advocates like Nia advocated to find someone a home. Some people, I met one man who just was waiting for his ID that had been lost and was in this bureaucratic mess. Only when he got it, could get his ID, could he leave? Another person was, it was because of the bed bugs in the shelter, he didn't wanna go. Every person has a different situation. And so it is, it's still cheaper to deal individually with people than it is uh, to institutionalize them. So bringing all these solutions together and then just bringing in the people who aren't here to ask them why haven't these amazing solutions happened? Uh, let's go forward with them and uh, remove those barriers. Thank you. 
Great. Um, I did not forget anybody there. Uh, I don't think. <laughs> Raise your hand if I did. Uh, and if not, Gabe, you can take away the next one. Yeah, sure. Um, so the next question actually comes from me. Uh, I'm a young person. I'm very concerned about climate change. It's what motivated me to become involved in politics to begin with. Um, I think that at the municipal level, the discussion around climate change has mostly focused on how other issues or other, other solutions can also be climate solutions. Things like public transit um, and densification uh, can also be climate solutions by preventing sprawl. But do you have any suggestions, any ideas for climate policy uh, that is specifically geared toward helping Toronto um, reach its its um, emissions commitments, reductions commitments? That's my question. Okay, um, so our climate question. Uh, Chloe, you're middle of the pack on this one. Uh, Robert is up to, uh, to go first. So if you're ready, 60 seconds. Sure. Um, I think uh, the citizens need to understand the plan the city has. And, and it should, I believe, it involves electrification. So electrify furnaces, stoves, water heaters, uh, cars, you know, and we need to help people move in that direction. We need to get efficient. Canada is the worst efficiency. Someone was saying on water and CO2 and energy. And that means going to heat pumps, going to induction stoves, smaller cars, even eat less meat. But mostly what's missing in Toronto is leadership. We need leadership on generation, solar, access to solar through Toronto Hydro and hookups. And we've seen the mayor who can't seem to even get them to go LED in, at night. Um, we need support for carbon pricing. We need building code changes in Toronto. We're building like crazy and all of it is not what it should be in terms of efficiency. Great, thank you. Um, so uh, over to you on climate in the city. Yeah, so for in regards to climate, um, there is definitely some policies actually in place um, that I am considering implementing, but they're not gonna be the immediately the first thing that I would want to kind of implement. Um, the main things that I do wanna focus on, which indirectly does contribute to helping dealing with climate change is improving transit and like um, housing and some of the other components. Like for example, being able to improve transit, for instance, um, we'll be able to promote people to use the TDC more frequently and then getting people more on public transit that can help reduce the amount of cars being used in the city. And then the other part as well too is like, so one part of the plan is to have more arts and events and activities in other parts of uh, Toronto. So in North Etobicoke, North York, and in Scarborough, and then having also creating, you know, different types of venues in these areas. And then in dealing with like, for example, traffic and congestion, then um, this can help deal with um, climate change and stuff in an indirect way, but that's the approach, yeah. Thank you. Uh, Nia Singh, you're up next. Thank you. Um, one thing I just want to state is that climate change is natural. So what we have to remember, this is a pollution issue. And we have to do everything we can to reduce pollution. And just like the previous speaker, Ms., uh, Mr. Soad, um, we have to find ways to make the TTC the preferred choice of transportation. And the best way to do that is to reduce the Metro Pass. Like I propose cutting the Metro Pass in half or even less. If TTC was more affordable, people would use it more often. We have to improve our, our subway system, make it run 24 hours if possible. Um, there's people doing early shifts and they can't get on the subway. They take multiple buses either late at night or early in the morning. So really it comes down to finding ways for us to be more uh, energy efficient, but extremely it has to do with the fossil fuels and the burning of fossil fuels. Um, another thing is, and we have to also look at our waste because a lot of waste produces these emissions that um, are unacceptable. Okay, thank you. Good. Um, Darren Atkinson, over to you. Yeah, so I agree we should electrify all transportation. I mean, buses should all be electric, but I'm not going to speak to that. I'll speak to something I have firsthand um, contact with. If you take a look at my LinkedIn account, you'll realize 
that my past was, uh, you know, I was on the verge of homelessness, but I always got out of it. I built a recording studio. I paid for a patent by going through garbage professionally. I'm talking about building highly technical things out of nothing. Really, what we do is we subsidize industry. Everybody that washes a piece of plastic or whatnot, they're doing it so that the local businesses can fill our landfill. We take a ton of energy and expend it. So here's a different way to think. We need to reject the carbon footprint to begin with. No more plastic sold in stores. If that means the Weston family got to rethink what's on their shelves, too bad or pay us some money. If that means huge brands like the Johnson Johnson family don't like the 20 cents we're going to put on something because you put it in plastic, too bad. We can raise money that way. Then we could rebuild a recycling program. Only 8% of plastic gets recycled. It's a disgrace. You can do things about this, but you got to think outside the box. And this would also be the one thing we could do something about, make it a plastic smart Sorry, Dan, I had to I had to cut you off there. Thank you, and uh, Chloe Brown, one minute. Okay, so when I'm thinking about green environments, sustainable materials for construction is really important. So things like hempcrete to aid in the first and last mile repaving to gradually phase out cement is really important. Having urban gardens, so vertical and horizontal urban agriculture could reduce the amount of like miles that it takes for food to get to us. And it could also offset our reliance on certain uh, stores for those materials. Additionally, looking at textile waste and how we reward environmentally sustainable tax credits to businesses that repurpose goods. Repair cafes are also a really important thing. Um, additionally, smart composting and smart infrastructure for waste management are really important. So when we're looking at engaging young people in environmental sustainability, having a smart waste management lab is really important and being able to reward young people for their innovations through their college and university networks will help us to make this more scalable. Done. Right. Um, <clears throat> Sarah, you're up. So kind of the first rule, I guess, in environmentalism to me is think globally, act locally. So when we talk about climate change, that's thinking globally. But what engages residents and what will make a difference in every day is acting locally. So we have to focus on local actions. Like Nia says, pollution. Um, Chloe's mentioning vertical gardens, like things that make life better for our life support systems now, cleaner air, cleaner air waterfront, transit, housing, people that can walk where they're going. Every positive environmental action we take here has a benefit globally. And I think we just need to concentrate on what we can do instead of worrying about these giant targets and scary things that have people paralyzed or thinking they don't even wanna to touch the issue. So I think the city has to take its own roles and look at, the, look at our own environment by city actions. Look at our own impacts on the environment, change those, and then engage residents by talking about quality of life when it comes to uh, positive environmental actions. So, thank you. Good. Set. And uh, Philip, uh, you're the last word on this one. Hey, all my colleagues have amazing ideas. All we lack is the culture. We got to change the culture of this city. We got to have to think green. We got to work green. And we got to share green. 2013, they, or sorry, 2015, they put this, they want to reach the goals by 2030. It's not going to happen. We have to be realistic. You know, they have these facades that we're going to reach the goals by this certain time and then 2050. If we don't change the culture of our city, right now we all like driving. I mean, I like driving. I drive to the Victoria Park subway to take the subway down. You know, I take the bus, but the bus service here sucks. We got to change, like, I want to, uh, I think said major, but the uh, the TTC or service it's got to improve. People got to enjoy going on the bus. Got to enjoy taking taking a bike. You know, we got to change the culture. Start with our kids in school. Educate them. Show them what we did before, and we, and we can do it again. Okay, um, got that one in under sixty seconds. And Gabe, I think we um, maybe we want to. Talk about the conclusion now. Um, yeah. Uh, with the last question. Yeah. So um, thank you all so much for your for your answers. Um, I was yeah. Uh, and now we're going to move into the um, maybe closing statements, um, both from us from the EDA uh, 
and from all of you. Uh, so this is going to be shorter than your opening statement. Uh, we can we can just do one minute. Um, and th yeah, this is your chance to obviously let us know how we can find you and reach you. Um, and also to sort of make your, your strongest uh, statement as far as what you'd like to achieve uh, as mayor. Um, and then and then Tim, um, I'll, we'll make some closing remarks as the EDA, but I figure we'll just do a one minute closing. Yeah, and we'll keep our own closing statement short. Um, yep. Two hours is a long time, I think. It is. It's great in, ter in terms of keeping to time and the mechanics, um it's been it's been awesome so um the so this will be i think we're okay we'll we'll give it 90 we'll split the difference uh 90 second sure. finishing um if you're prepared for 60 it's actually better coming in under with that you know uh, yes sense of conclusion is actually a good thing um so ad uh you are up first so um 90 seconds Okay, sure. So thank you everyone for taking your time to actually sit through this two hours. I know it's like a long day after a weekday, especially on a Wednesday, which sucks all together. Um, but then you're still here out here listening to everything that we have to say. We, uh, we really do appreciate that from the bottom of our hearts. Um, to, so to get some more information about my platform and myself, um, you can visit my website at www.soadqhossein.com. And then there we'll have details about my platform, who I am, and then other details as well um, too. And then the other thing too, you're always welcome to message me by text as well, 647-892-2470. Uh, I'm available to approach anytime. Perfect. Um, so I showed us how to do it short and sweet. Uh, Nia, uh, you are up, 90 seconds if you need it. Thank you. Um, you can Google my name, Nia Singh, and you will see enough information about me, interviews and articles, and info at electniasing.ca. Um, electniasing.ca, you can get more information. Just want to address in my final statement uh, the issue that has not been touched on, which is the COVID-19 lockdowns. As mayor of Toronto, I would never allow our city to be put in that position, nor our city workers, police, firefighters, city staff, to be fired from their jobs for not taking uh, an inoculation that they do not understand or do not wish to take. Evidence-based decision-making is what is most important. We have seen that between unvaccinated and vaccinated, the outcomes are similar. Therefore, there is no reason to discriminate the way we have. Um, the policies of the province and our city as a result have resulted in much division in families. It has resulted in loss of livelihood. It has prevented people from getting an education. And we as a city should be a shining example to the rest of the world. We are the most diverse city in the world, yet we have allowed ourselves to fall into the same pattern of thinking, following a common narrative, and not questioning science, biology, and reality. Um, it's extremely important that we have a leader that is not afraid to speak out. Do your research on me, please, and you will see that I have always been speaking out for in, against injustice and for the common people. Thank you. Vote elect. Nia Singh. Okay, that was right on 90 seconds. Very good. Uh, Darren, uh, your turn. Just like to thank you for having all of us. I mean, really, this is, uh, this is how democracy should work, where people get the information from the people that are running and the candidates can be seen. Um, thank you very much. It's not happening in other outlets. Um, if you want to learn about myself, go to DAMA. Y-O-R, D-A-Mayor.ca, you'll find I have a 12-point plan. And um, I actually have a 13th point, so I guess my dozen is going to turn into a baker's dozen. The emergency affordable housing plan that I've thought out is going to be up on my site as of tomorrow. I've actually made this plan up from information I've got from all the people on the streets of Toronto, because uh, having no uh, you know, events to go to, I just basically have been pounding the payment and talking to people personally and accumulating that information, I've come up with a plan that I think could work. So please go to my site, damayor.ca, take a look at my credentials and LinkedIn. I solve problems with very little resources. That is a skill. It's not one that everybody uses all the time, but I've never had many resources. So we're heading into times when there's not gonna be 
the land of plenty with high interest rates and people are going to be in hard financial times, I think I can actually bring the ideas that could work. And I would allow other people to modify them and be involved in implementing them. So it wouldn't be a matter of one person having all the expertise. The idea has to be unique. It has to be outside the box. We just don't have the money to go down the same old roads of ideas that we've been pursuing in the past. Some of them I like, but the time is gone. Even this mayor, I voted for him last time, but I wouldn't vote for him now because when the times got tough, he failed. So, sorry, Danny, I had to cut you off there. Thank you. Um, Chloe Brown, uh, your final statements, 90 seconds if you need it. Okay. So, thank you very much for giving me a space to have this conversation. As a policy analyst working at a university, I have been listening to you through emails, phone calls, and I have a really deep understanding that the, the system is broken from helping people move from EI to Ontario Works, ODSP, trying to find OSAP from ages 18 to 60, people want an opportunity to use their skills. And as someone who does that every day by helping people navigate policy programs and services, I think that it's time that someone gives residents the power to use their abilities to fix their communities. This is why I'm championing restoring democracy, because while I'm not here to shake down capitalism, it's time to put it on a shelf. It's time to get back to democratic principles that allow all of us to have one vote and action in our community that results in change. And the only way that that happens is by putting out corporate Canada's Blackie, John Tory, and helping him have a wonderful retirement party because it's time for people to work. And we've been working below our capacity because of the way that policy has been working for corporate Canada to make profits instead of to make prosperity for everyone. So let's put prof people before profits. And on October 24th, vote for Chloe because that's my intention. Give us democracy or, you know, <laughs> give us nothing else because this is this is it it's a vote for rogers or toronto because for the last eight years that's what john tory's priorities have been to make this city a corporation instead of a community and the only way to fight it is to take the power back through democracy thank you for your time and have a great night bye very good thank you um sarah uh, it's your turn. Thank you. Uh, so vote Sarah.ca is where you can find out my platform. Um, and one of the items on my platform is eliminate mandates. So I did want to thank Nia for wrenching that because this it's still alive, the discrimination that was created over the past two years. It's still with us. And I think progressive people need to realize that vulnerable people are being hurt. And I think it's good that Nia is speaking out about it and I'm speaking about it because it's not what the media says, that bad people are opposed to mandates and good people want them. So I just wanna echo Nia's comments and say, it's really important for us to keep this in mind as part of our, our toolbox of how we treat people in this city. I wanna also talk about environmentalism because this is a group that cares so much so deeply. And I want environmentalism to no longer be kind of a religion. It's something people need to do. If they're good, they're gonna take care of the environment and where you know people get criticized if they don't. Environmentalism has to be easy. It just, it, people will do the thing that's good for the environment if it's easy automatically we've got these systems that make it difficult to do things that take care of our environment that take care of our air and our water and our land so we've just got to change our city system so that it's no longer on the resident to be do the right thing the natural the resident will naturally do the right thing um and just the last thing i would say with these last few seconds is all of us do have really good ideas. All of us really do have great energy and, and drive and all of you do as well. And so after this election, whichever one of us is in power, whether it's us or someone not in this room, um, we still can keep working together and grab these ideas and run with them, all of us. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Um, and you actually stole my concluding lines there, Sarah. I'll go with that. <laughs> Last comment, but I may I may echo them a little bit. Um, Philip, uh, you are up next. Ninety seconds, if you need it. Great. Well, I just say thanks, guys, for having us. Make us put all this together. It's a lot of work, you know. And thanks to all my colleagues who are great ideas, like from blew over my head. Um, you want to find my uh, platform, Twitter, it's Philip 
pick up the D Cruise or Facebook. My platform is on the visual art stuff, something different. It's all doable. It's easy. It's all for the people. I'm here for the people. They vote for me. I'll make mistakes. We all make mistakes. There's no such thing as perfection. But all these people's ideas, with their permission, if I get in, I like to use a lot of their ideas. And if they get in, use my ideas, they go out the door. So I'm a simple guy, regularly. I'm not a photo ops guy. I went into uh, condos and all that stuff, rich, making profits, all that. As you know, we make profits off people who shouldn't make, or city should make money, not making, taking money out of the city. So you vote for me, I'll get the job. I know military guy knows to get the job done. I know numbers, I know finances. You know, it's a learning process. Every day is a learning process. And I tell my friends and my nephews and nieces, it's okay to make a mistake, own your mistake and move on. And that's how you make a better person. Thanks for having me. Great, thank you. Um, and Robert, you will get the concluding uh, statement of the evening now. Great, thanks a lot. Um, I guess what I'd like to say to people is um, I'm the candidate who's been working within the system for 30 years. I've advised four mayors, three regional chairs, um, but not a premier. And with the strong mayor powers, the reason I'm here today is because democracy in Toronto is under threat. The, the premier can now dictate to the mayor what he wants. I, I would feel very disillusioned to be a council these days because the mayor can veto anything that they decide so there's got to be some changes there's got to be someone who can stand up for the city we now have a strong mayor system and a weak city and that's why i'm here and that's why i want to apply my 30 years of experience in all of these areas from transit to waste management to housing and get it right and and stand up for the citizens who need the services not um, the corporate interests that others have alluded to. Hatton for mayor is my, uh, my byline. You might see me riding around on a motorcycle with a flag out the back. I don't know if you can see it, but it's Hatton for mayor and you can find out everything you need to know about me. Thanks. Thank you. Sweet. Um, well, Tim, why, Tim, why don't you go ahead? Sure. Um... First of all, thank you uh, to the panelists, to the attendees, um, and to the support uh, supporting people um, uh, at the Electoral District Association for the Green Party here. Uh, Gabe, you, um, Adam, John, Annie, uh, folks who contributed. Um, I'm going to echo one of the last comments a little bit. I heard good ideas from every single person on this panel. I really did. Um, I'm impressed. I didn't think I wouldn't be impressed, but I'm I'm very impressed um, having having sat here for um, almost two hours. And um, it's true. What, what we're talking about ultimately is public policy, what civic policy, how to get it made and implemented, um, and good people with good ideas in between elections, which is one thing we talk about a lot at our little association here. Um, it's so important that it's not 90 days from election day um, that these good ideas start getting talked about. Uh, so come together, um, reach out to one another, reach out to us um, and let's talk more about public policy and, um, and get some solutions implemented, better solutions for the city. So yeah, so thank you all. And that's, uh, that's my last word. Yeah, and I'll also maybe say a brief statement i was also just so impressed by the the level of discourse that we were also willing you were also willing to engage on questions of policy um and talk about them seriously and treat them with the with the respect that they deserve because this is democracy i am um, i know what it is to run against a powerful incumbent uh back in june i was deputized by the green party of the ontario to run in etobicoke north against the premier and I, um, well, let's just say that I only got, the, the no, votes numbered in the hundreds, um, but I, the way I think about it and, and the way I encourage everyone to think about it is that um, each of those votes, that is somebody who is showing their support for um, more, a, a more robust discussion of policy. Um, that was, that was, Every single one of those 690 votes was a little bit of democracy. Uh, and this too is, is our own little piece of democracy. So I'm really, really grateful that you all took the time to come out um, and the attendees as well. It is a Wednesday night. It was two hours. 
um, and, but your commitment to democracy, um, it, it's, it's going to go a long way. So thank you all so much. Um, and have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you. Every evening around. Okay. <laughs> bye bye. Good evening. Good luck, everybody. Yeah, best of luck. You, how's it going, Tim? I can't hear you right now. Just, so I just want to decompress with Gabe for a second, if it's all right. Oh yeah, maybe we can transition it to a, a meeting. Um, Tim, why don't we I, hop into my? Yeah, why don't we hop well, into the? Or I'm tired too. We can decompress yeah. if you want. I got something else to do. I gotta go run, have okay. a coffee to wake up and. Let's uh, let's maybe talk. Let's uh, hours let's chat tomorrow. Yeah. Okay. I'm thanks, gonna, buddy. It went well. Um, that was that was awesome. Yeah, it went really well. Hey, thanks so much, Tim, for all your yeah. work on this. All right. Take care. Talk later.